Welcome to Protecting Your Music, Music Copyright. My name is Susan Dernan, and I am the Administration Lead of the Mississauga Arts Council. This webinar is part of our TD Culture Lab Professional Development Webinar Series, presented by the Mississauga Arts Council and sponsored by TD Bank Group. The Mississauga Arts Council is dedicated to enabling the growth of the arts by creating opportunity and connection between artists and residents in Mississauga and beyond. Now in our 42nd year, the Mississauga Arts Council is a registered charity dedicated to our vision of Mississauga as a vibrant cultural community where arts and culture thrive. The Mississauga Arts Council acknowledges that the land on which we gather is part of the treaty and traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, the Huron-Wendat and Wyandot Nations. We are grateful to have the opportunity to work on this land and give our respect to these peoples and their ancestors who have been inhabitants and caretakers of this land since time immemorial. We also recognize that Mississauga is now home to many global Indigenous peoples. All right, it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter tonight, Melissa Johnson. I was first introduced to Melissa when she joined us for a music panel discussion last fall. Her insights into copyright and digital music rights were really wonderful, and I'm so happy to have her back tonight. Melissa is a music business professional with over 13 years experience in music publishing, specializing in mechanical licensing and royalty processing. She joined the team at Metalworks Institute in 2019 as an instructor and has since taken on the role of student success coordinator. After graduating Durham College's Entertainment in Administration program in 2006, she be began her career at Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency, helping the industry make the transition from physical media in the age of streaming, and she dealt directly with the largest music publishers, major and independent record labels. So let's pass things over to Melissa to get started. Welcome, Melissa. Thank you, Susan. Welcome, everyone. Um, thank you to Susan and Mississauga Arts Council for having me back where I get to nerd out a little bit and talk about all things nerdy, which includes royalties. Um, so I know some people think, oh, this business, this administrative side, it's, it's not the cool side, but I'm hoping we can change your mind a little bit. Um, it is incredibly important for all rights holders to sort of know what, what they're dealing with, right? What are the royalties that you are entitled to? So uh, quick question, you can, you know, post in the chat. Um, if you do have questions, post them in the chat. Susan will be sort of keeping track of all that for me because I can talk and talk a little bit, um, but welcome. I'm just curious how many people, what sort of they're looking for? Are you songwriters? Are you performers? Um, hello there. Uh, I am a songwriter, singer, uh, you know, all that jazz. I'm looking to get a little information on copyright okay. and business. Amazing. Yeah, okay, so lots of songwriters and performers. Um, so that's very good. It gives me a good sort of understanding. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen, so. Okay, perfect. So as Susan mentioned, what we're going to talk about today is protecting your music and copyright specifically. So the Canadian music royalty ecosystem can be, for some people, when you're first coming in and approaching, it's a little overwhelming. It's intimidating. Um, but I'm going to break this down for you in a few ways so that it's a little easier for us to understand. So the first thing we need to understand is intellectual property. It's a concept or a term that gets tossed around a lot within this industry, but what does it really mean? So when we say intellectual property, what you're really talking about is a creation of the mind. So that's going to include everything, as it says there, from inventions to literary and artistic works, designs, symbols. And intellectual property is protected in law by either a trademark, a patent, or a copyright. Why this is so important is that it allows the creators, the people who own 
that intellectual property to be financially compensated for their intellectual property. So copyright is one form of protection, okay? And it is a legal term that's used to describe the rights that the creators have over their literary and artistic works. So you as songwriters have protection for what your work is. A lot of people wonder, what do I need to do, right? What do I need to do for, to make sure that I have copyright protection? Well, when you write a song and that song is fixed in a tangible form, so that could be a recording, that could be sheet music that you've written out, your song is then automatically protected by copyright. Okay, I know that's sort of a weird concept. You're like, how do I actually maintain that? Well, there's a few different things you can do. So it is automatically protected once it's in a fixed or tangible form, okay? Um, some people will choose to go that extra step and register that copyright. You can do that through a few different ways. So you can do it by registering with CEPO or the Canadian Intellectual Property Office. Okay. Another way is, and I'll share some of these links with you guys, um, or with Susan to share with you, is you can look at the Songwriters Association of Canada. Okay. They're a great resource, especially for songwriters. And they have a ton of resources. So it is a membership-based organization. But what they offer is um, a song vault. Okay, the Canadian Song Vault. So their members can register and their songs then become in record as part of the Song Vault. Okay, so the Song Vault in Canada maintains a recording of the song and the song's date of creation and filing. So Songwriters Association of Canada, their website is songwriters.ca, okay, for anyone who's interested in checking them out. But what rights do you have as the copyright owner or the rights holder? Well, you alone, only you, unless you have other additional co-writers. You have the exclusive right to reproduce the work, to perform the work publicly, to record the work, to broadcast the work, and to translate the work into other languages or to adapt the work. Okay, so copyright is a powerful tool that we have, um, especially as those of you who are creatives. Now this chart, I don't know about you, um, but for me, as I said, copyright's complicated, okay? What I'd like you to think of when we talk about the musical ecosystem, I want you to think of a musical work as being made up of two distinct parts. So on this chart, you'll see that one and three fall under the category of song and two and four fall under recording. Okay, so the two distinct parts of a musical creation are the musical work or the song, which is created by songwriters. And then we also have that recording. So that's what you're going to listen to on the radio, right? The actual recorded version of that song. Now, when we talk about copyright and just, I should point out, so um, CMO rights comparison at the top, a CMO is a um, collective management organization, okay? So you see in this chart, it's kind of split. Um, into song and recording along the top, but then the different rights, reproduction or performance. And we're going to dive into those a little bit more. Um, so 
Section one there, those are royalties associated with the performance of the song. Section two is the performance of the recording. On the bottom half, you're looking at the reproduction of the song for number three. And number four is the reproduction of the recording. So all of these sort of represent different rights holders involved in the making of music. And I always like to go back to, right, the music industry is based on one thing. It all starts with a song, okay? So there are different rights holders involved, absolutely. So when we talk about rights holders, when it comes to musical works or songs and recordings, there's four main rights holders. You have the performer, the maker. So that's typically going to be a record label, whoever owns that master recording. If you are a completely independent artist, that would be you. Um, you have the songwriter and or composer. And fourth, you have a music publisher. But if you are a songwriter or a composer and you do not have a publishing deal, guess what? You are a publisher. You maybe just don't call yourself that yet, okay? So there's a number of different things at play. I like the visual. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, some of the organizations that work within the Canadian music ecosystem. Usually when I ask this question, the first one that comes up is, oh, so can, right? People know so can, that's a big name that they're familiar with. But there are other major players within the royalty or music ecosystem. And that's what I'd like to point out. So so can is in the business of collecting and administering performance royalties, okay? Performance royalties are collected for the public performance of a musical work. So that's gonna represent number one on this visual, okay? The performance of a song. And those rights are owned by the publisher or a self-published songwriter. So if you are a self-published songwriter and you have not yet registered with SOCAN, that should be number one on your to-do list, okay? Because if your song is performed anywhere in public, SOCAN collects data from broadcasters, venues, restaurants, everything, okay? And they pay royalties out to songwriters that are self-published or their publishers for the public performance of the song, okay? So that's number one on the chart. Now we go to number two. You can sign up, you know, follow it across. So you have the recording and the performance. So that is for the performance of a recording, okay? Now that right is typically owned by the label or if you're an independent artist or the artist entrepreneur. So that is collected in Canada and administered by an organization called ReSound, R-E colon, sound. Okay. And they are going to collect and administer royalties for the public performance of the recording. The bottom part here we have, we're looking at reproduction. So all of these things are, you know, for you to protect you as the copyright owner. So for the reproduction right of the song, which is number three, so the musical work, you can choose to either affiliate yourself with CMRA,
the Canadian Musical Reproduction Rights Agency, or so can RR. Okay, and they're going to pay for the reproduction right of the song. Those rights are also owned by the publisher or self-published songwriters. And number four is for the reproduction of the recording. And for that right in Canada, you would want to affiliate yourself with Connect Music Licensing or Soprock. Okay. I know if it's overwhelming, it's okay. I like visuals. So I want to show this next one. Okay. So this is the who's who of music royalties in Canada. And why I think this is great is it gives you sort of their logos and you can visually sort of see who's responsible for what. So if you are, the majority of you are primarily songwriters or composers, it gives you sort of a visual of who do you need to affiliate with in order to make sure that you're collecting all monies because we don't want to leave any money on the table, right? So as you can see in this image, you're looking at SOCAN and SOCAN RR or CMRA for the mechanical. Now mechanical, I know it sounds like a strange term to a lot of people, but really um, it's coming from a long time ago. That title of mechanical royalty is coming from back in the time we had gramophones, when there was a physical reproduction that was happening. And also, you know, we had physical reproductions of CDs, cassettes, vinyl. For that reason, Everything that's a reproduction falls under this umbrella of a mechanical royalty. In addition, though, okay, I don't want you to just think about physical products because there is a mechanical associated with online music licensing. Okay, so for permanent downloads, limited downloads, on demand streaming, webcasting. There are mechanical royalties associated with that. And all of these organizations you can see on this chart from SOCAN to CMRA, Connect, SOPROC, Artisty, MROC, RAX, Resound, they are all organizations that exist to protect, to protect the industry and to protect the creators. That is their sole sort of mandate. So they are the people who are constantly lobbying the Copyright Board of Canada for better and more equitable payment for creatives. Okay. So if you are a songwriter and a composer, I would suggest that you make sure you go and affiliate with SOCAN and or CMRA, okay? The next piece is if you are a master owner. So if you, in addition to writing your own music, okay, you are producing that recording and you own that recording, you, would want to sign up with Connect Music Licensing or SOPROC. Now SOPROC is primarily, primarily based out of Quebec and handles a lot of the French um, language clients. Connect Music Licensing has great resources on their website. So that's if you own that master recording. Now, if you are a performer, so you are performing your own original works, or maybe you're doing background vocals for someone else on a physical recording. Then you can decide between one of those three organizations, okay? Artisty, MROC, which is the Musicians' Rights Organization of Canada, or ACTRA-REX. 
you can choose one of the three, look at them, see what works for you, what you sort of connect with, and they will pay out to performers on a recording. There's even more visuals and charts. It's very exciting. Okay, so I'll make sure to share all of these with you because I do think they're really helpful. Um, it kind of can give you a little checklist to go through. Okay, yes, I've checked that one off. Yes, I've checked that off, checked off here so that you know you have that. But what I will say is you need to take the next step. Okay, so first things first, you're going to go and you're going to make sure that you sign up with the relevant organizations that you should be signed up with. But next step, make sure when you write a new song or you're on a new recording that you go log into your accounts with these organizations and update that information. The music industry has largely become, especially when it comes to royalties, very data driven. So the more information that you have about your song or your recording, the easier it is for their internal systems to do a lot of auto matching, which means guess what? You get paid faster. And I think we'd all like to make sure that any monies that are owed to us are in our pockets as quickly as possible. Right? Because that is your money. So is anyone here affiliated with any of these organizations? I'm going to go back to the chart, but I'm just going to stop sharing for a minute. So the chat so would be, can yes, so can, yes, yes. We even exactly. have a spoken word artist who just joined so can. See, this is exactly what I expected. I see so many people who always say, yes, they are signed up with so can. Okay, resound, connect. Yes, love that. Um, you're missing a few. So if you take nothing else away from this is um, if you're not registered for your mechanical royalties with SOCAN RR, that's something you will want to look at, okay? Um, it's a great, it's amazing. Uh, they actually have deals with TikTok now. So there is a reproduction right associated with TikTok. Um, let's see if I can do, 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 start share again. Okay. So this is CMRA's website. Share. There we go. Okay. So you can see um, the services that they offer. So CMRA, in addition, a lot of these organizations, I should mention, they're based out of Canada and what they're collecting and administering is any mechanical or performance royalties that occur or are accrued within Canada. But what you can see they do offer is international collections as well. Um, I know MROC has that as well as so can. But this was pretty exciting for a lot of people because CMRA struck a deal with TikTok to deliver a new revenue stream for music publishers and self-published songwriters. So they're collecting digital mechanical royalties in Canada for TikTok. And it does include past use of songs on the platform. Because what they recognized and what a lot of people, you know, need to remember is that TikTok is a big way that people are discovering new music and consuming music. So much so that when um, IFPI did their study, so they represent uh, the major record companies worldwide. OK, um, and they do studies on how people consume and engage with music. And three years ago, TikTok and short form video were not even registering 
now they represent between 10 and 12% of how people consume and engage with music. So this is only growing. So being able to get in there, you know, if you have a song that blows up on TikTok, why? Yes, sign me up, I'll take payment. Okay, so they also, as I mentioned, offer international collections. They're partnered with the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective in the US. And the MLC collects royalties for the mechanical from digital service providers in the US. So if someone in the US is listening to your song on Spotify, and you're affiliated with CMRA, they can on your behalf collect that money for you and pay it out. Okay, they're also partnered with Impel for the collection of digital royalties for those territories outside of North America. But as you can see here, this is, Impel's always expanding, but this is just a few of their territories they represent. So, from Switzerland all the way down to the bottom to, I'll say Ukraine because I do not wanna mispronounce that last country. Okay, so CMRA for your mechanicals. I'm glad people are with SOCAN. Um, I'm glad that some people are affiliated with Connect. But for the songwriters out there, the key, so can and CMRA, okay? Sign up, they, there's no fee to sign up with these organizations. Um, they are incredibly helpful. Thing you have to remember too is the people who work there are people who have a vested interest largely in seeing the success of the music industry. So they are happy to help you. I'm so excited. Um, if you are on the other side and you also are recording these and have um, master recordings, okay, that's where you want to look at connect. And I would honestly, I'm going to pull them up for you. So Connect is one of those organizations, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the ISRC, the International Sound Recording Code. So every recording has a unique code that's assigned to it. That's where this part, when I was mentioning how important data is, that's where that comes in. Um, there's also an ISWC, International Standard Work Code, that's for the song, the ISRC is for the recording. Okay, SOCAN is able to help you with ISWCs and CONNECT is able to help you with the ISRC. Okay, so CONNECT's um, website is here. Okay, so I make music, right? You can click to find out what you need to know. Um, they represent major record companies, independent labels, as well as artists and producers who own or control the copyright in the vast majority of sound recordings. Okay, so if you make a recording at home, and let's say you want to put that recording up, right? You find a music aggregator, DistroKid, TuneCore, whatever it may be, and your music is up on Spotify. Well, you obviously have the right and the control of that master recording, which means you are entitled to any royalties associated with that. Okay, so Connect is um, a great option as well. If you're the master owner, you can look at Soprock. Um, I, I, they do handle predominantly and work based out of Quebec, but you can take a look. 
And the last piece is because I'm seeing that people, yes, there are songwriters, but there's also singers and performers. So if you are a performer, I mentioned that there's a few uh, different organizations. So ReSound in Canada collects what's known as a neighboring right. Okay. And they will distribute that to either MROC, Musicians' Rights Organization of Canada, ACTRA RACS, or Artisti. And that is payment for performers on a recording. So it's always interesting to me, a lot of people think that when we talk performance rights or performance royalties, that it will go to the performer of the song. Let's say uh, Whitney Houston's version of I Will Always Love You. That's actually a fantastic example. The performance royalty in that case, it does not go to Whitney Houston because a performance royalty goes to the publisher and or self-published songwriter. Let's see if I have this option on here. So I know it's a lot of information and charts, but there are some ways you can sort of start to work through it. So if we look at a song, Right, everything starts with a song. So let's say, for example, I write a song. Okay, my song's going to be called Love. <laughs> and I am a self published songwriter. Okay, so here I have this song, Love, written by Melissa Johnston, and I'm self published. Well, Susan, she heard about this song. And Susan's a fantastic singer. So Susan decides she's going to get together um, a few of her friends and they're going to record it, right? So Susan and her friends record this song. Let's, I'm gonna put it in the chat. Okay, so we have Love performed by Susan. Thank you. I'm sure you're a great singer. No, terrible. Nobody wants that recording. <laughs> no one wants my recording either. Um, <laughs> That's okay, why we're writers, so, not singers, right? Right. So we have this song and then I'm the songwriter. Now, Susan, do you have a record label or are you independent? Um, I, I think I'm independent tonight. Okay. Back and forth. Let's be independent. Yeah. So we're just, you're, it's your own label. It's going to be Susan Records. I love it. Um, the publisher, it's, I don't have a publisher. Um, and if you wanted to, let's say, um, musicians, Okay, so we have you musicians. So I'm just going to pick names. Oh, you're going to, Arlene's going to perform with you. Um, Jaden, David, and Mark. Perfect. Okay, so I like to think of things this way. It helps me, and I found this really helpful to place where do these royalties, who gets what? It's too confusing. So in this case, we have this song, okay? This, the musical work. Like I said, you have to separate. There's two different streams. So let's just think of the musical work or the song first off. So the song is called Love. I, Melissa Johnston, am the songwriter and I do not have a publisher. I am going to register that musical work with SOCAM and CMRA. And when they collect the performance royalties for the public performance of that song, SoCan is going to pay me because I'm the self-published songwriter. Now for the mechanicals, 
let's say Susan decided she was going to press 500 copies of this on vinyl because her audience loves a good vinyl. She would need to apply to CMRA for a reproduction right because she's making a physical reproduction. And she would apply to them and they would issue her an ind individual license. But that license, when she paid them as her own label, they would then pay me that mechanical royalty as the songwriter. Right? Because the mechanical also goes to the publisher or self published songwriter. In addition, when she uploaded that and made it available on Spotify, any reproductions associated with that payment would come through to me as a mechanical and performance royalties would come through to me as a mechanical or sorry, as a performance. Okay. Now on the other side, you're probably wondering, well, why would Susan want to sing a song that she didn't write? Where is she, how is she going to get paid? Well, it's a great question. So Susan, as a performer, she chose to affiliate herself with MROC, for example, the Musicians Rights Organization of Canada. And so they would collect that neighboring right, resound, get the money, pay it to MROC, and MROC will pay Susan for her performance. But in addition to that, they're going to pay out to Arlene, Jaden, David, and Mark, who also performed on that recording, right? So Susan exists over on this side as of the recording, and I exist over here on the song side. Now, Susan has her own record label as well. So she owns that master recording. So for that, she would register with Connect and she would also get a royalty associated with that recording. So there's a reproduction right associated with the recording and a performance right associated with the recording. And there's a reproduction right and a performance right associated with the song. If you are... For those of you who are independent artists who write your own songs and make, you know, your own recordings, guess what? Check, check, check. You sign up for everything and you are entitled to all of those royalties. Does that make sense? I know it's a little complicated. Um, but I will make sure that we add sort of these, these visuals. I'll make sure Susan has access to those to share with you because I think that they're great just to have an understanding. But we know that there's a lot of talk right now um, within the music and entertainment industry about fair compensation for creatives, for songwriters, um, and this is the sort of ongoing battle that happens. So it's so important, I think, for anyone who's pursuing a career in music that you understand this. Because if you don't, it can become very, very easy to be taken advantage of or to leave money on the table. I can tell you from my years at... Um, CMRA, there are instances, there are songs out there that still remain unclaimed. Because people haven't registered that and that money just sits there. It sits there until someone claims that. Oh, so we have some questions. Let's see. Does the song vault have a cost? Okay, I'm going to look at a few of these things. So through SAC, let me just confirm what their membership fee is. I have like eight computer screens open right now. So bear with me. I'm not ignoring you. I'm just taking a look. Okay, so. Songwriters Association of Canada does have um, 
a membership fee. It's $60 for a year. Okay. Um, of course, they offer different memberships as well. So they have, you know, you can get a discount if you go for two years. It's two years for $100. Um, and that gives you access to all services and member voting rights with them. So they offer a lot of resources um, to their members. They do a lot of networking type of events where you can connect with other music creators, uh, publishers, a and managers, and industry professionals. Um, you do get access to use of the Song Vault to protect your copyright. You also get access to Song Pitch and they give information on songwriter agreements and other educational opportunities. Let's see, just looking at the questions. Or here, I can jump on and ask them. <laughs> okay. Um, someone was wondering, what is Song Trust? So Song Trust. Okay, so they're based in the U.S. Um, so they're a digital rights management platform. You have to remember that we have different, there are differences between the Canadian music royalty ecosystem. So in Canada, we have SOCAN. On the other side of the border, you would have ASCAP or BMI or CSAC. When you affiliate with SOCAN, they're going to ask you to choose one of those organizations. It's really completely up to you. Song Trust, I'm less familiar with, if I'm being honest. Um, and I choose to always be honest. Ooh, I, this is, this is just me. I always go with the tried and true, right? And I would say if you have questions about a different um, organization, do some research, talk to other people who may be using affiliated with them. It, I recommend the same thing when you're trying to look for an aggregator to make sure that you get your music up onto platforms. Um, does anyone have music available? Songs that they've written through Spotify, Apple Music? And if so, um, some of you choose to go with a music aggregator. And what I want you to know is that they'll offer to collect your royalties for you. But guess what? Do you think TuneCore or DistroKid are nonprofit organizations? They are not. So they can do that. They can collect your mechanicals. They can collect all of that for you if you check that box. But what that means is they're going to take a fee. So make sure you look at that. A lot of people think it's just going to make their life so much easier. Yeah, I'll just check the box. And I have had students um, or artists look at things, pull it up, and they don't even know where the money's coming from. They don't know what it's for. So it's an option, yes, but do I think it's just as easy for you to go on and sign up with SOCAN or CMRA and do this yourself? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do those organizations take a small administrative fee? Yes, but their administrative fee is minimal and it really is only to cover the costs of operating. They are not for-profit organizations. Right? They're not in the business of making money off of you. Um, they want to be able to maintain their service levels and provide you with what you need. Okay. 
Okay. So another interesting question. Uh, someone's looking to enter a song into a contest um, and wondering what sort of rights would be involved in that. Okay. So I am not a lawyer. First and foremost, um, I would make sure that you read sort of any of the fine print on what is happening with this contest, because firstly, you do not want to sign away any of your rights, but you would absolutely want to register your song with, if you are the songwriter, with SOCAN, um, with CMRA. And if you are supplying, if you're creating a recording of that song to submit for this contest, then you would also want to register that recording with um, Resound, but down the path, you can choose MROC, Actor Rax, or Artisti. And if you also own that recording, you would want to register it with Connect. Now, if someone else is the owner of that recording, they can register the recorded music piece, but you want to make sure you as the songwriter have registered that with CMRA and so can. Um, the, the person who's entering the contest, she said the contest is in the USA. Is that going to change any rights? No, you still want to register that here. Um, and you can submit, you can check off with them with SOCAN and CMRA. They'll ask if you want international collections. So you will choose when you sign up with SOCAN who you want the um, performance rights organization in the US to be. So that would be ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC. Most likely it's ASCAP or BMI. CSAC is more invite only based. Um, and for CMRA, they have an affiliation with the Mechanical Licensing Collective in the US. And so you just, it's an option that you check off international collections with them. Fantastic. So easy. <laughs> one well, checkbox with one organization. How great. I mean, it. they are making it with these, a lot of these Canadian um, organizations are doing a lot more in international collections because let's be honest, we don't want to just keep our talent here. We want to export it, right? And so they're big champions of getting Canadian content out into the world, but then also making sure that those Canadian creators are compensated for that. That's fantastic. Um, so we have a, an interesting question here. Um, someone's wondering, did they need to operate as a small business to write, record, and produce their music? Or can you they know, be an individual? You can absolutely be an individual. Um, I would say you, you might want to be aware of, you know, and look at some of the details on registering a small business, especially if you start to collect a lot of money in royalties, right? That you may want to register a business, um, but you do not have to, right? I could record a song. I could walk next door to Metalworks Studios and record a song, go through DistroKid and upload it. And I can do that just as myself. Great. But if you do start to get certain level of traction, you know, you may want to look at that. Um, so can like these people, they're great to guide you with some of that as well. And I should mention in addition, um, look at some of the other benefits that you can get as a creative, you know, Mississauga Arts Council does all these incredible things. Well, these organizations do similar um, things as well. But they, you know, they have foundations. So there's grants. There's a lot there. And all you need to do is pick up the phone and call them, right? Pick up the phone. Call Mississauga Arts Council. Tell them what you're kind of looking at. And maybe they can guide you. The same with SOCAN and CMRA. These people have client service staff 
on hand to answer any questions, membership services, whatever title they go under, but it's their job to help you and guide you through this sort of journey. And some of the benefits are even things you might not expect. Um, I know sometimes the, the musicians union and I think so can have insurance deals. They absolutely no. do. Which when you're insuring an instrument, it, it, it's pretty hard to do. And there's very few companies that are going to get you that special insurance rate for, for something you use as your job. So those are some, some good perks, definitely, that you wouldn't necessarily think of off the top of your head. No. And I know um, MROC also, like you just have to look at these things. So MROC, I'm just looking at them right now. So additional membership benefits for members. So if you're a musician who performs with a band and you and or your bandmates are interested in formalizing your business relationship as a partnership, so that would be registering, take advantage of half an hour and free legal service services they offer from music and copyright lawyer Craig Parks, who is MROC's legal counsel. So they offer that. Um, they have equipment insurance. It's, yeah, so there's a lot of things. I know SOCAN for members, they have SOCAN House, which is an application um, that you, you apply for, but that, let's see, that's what it is under A&R. Um, they offer like Song Camp Mondays. They have um, SOCAN houses. So SOCAN is pleased to offer accommodation in Los Angeles. Nashville and Paris exclusively for SOCAN writers, composers, and publishers who are visiting those cities to further their career, their craft, or their business. So that could be, hey, I got invited to a songwriting camp in Nashville. You can fill out the form and see if you can make a reservation at the SOCAN house, which is pretty incredible, right? So there's a lot of things happening. In addition to all the incredible things they already do, they offer, you know, some additional sort of perks that'll help you in your career. Definitely. Um, we have an interesting comment here. She says, I'm self-publishing a book with my music. So she's getting ready for the future with lots of, lots of rights there and um, was sort of thinking, you know, from probably from tax time, what sort of benefits can you get as an incorporated business rather than just as an individual? And it's definitely worth looking into and finding some tax advice on. Um, certainly, if you get to a certain level, um, they make you start collecting HST, which is both, you know, frustrating because then you have to do an HST return, but it's beneficial because then all of that 13% that you sent out into the world, you can claim back. Um, so again, it's some of that tax time free money in your pocket and definitely worth talking to people about and figuring out whether it's worth it or not. So I can share with you, Susan, um, a link to another Ooh. talk that's recorded. Um, it was presented by Factor um, and Ontario Creates through the Music Managers Forum. Oh, nice. And it was taxes for creative entrepreneurs. Fantastic. <laughs> How with timely. A, Thank you. With a CPA. So I will share that with you and then you can share it with the group because it's, they were really going through and I, like, I join all of these. I'm always looking to learn something new because things change. So this one they went through and when I'm working with students here, Right. I want to make sure, yeah, they know their royalties. Absolutely. That's number one. But then what are the next steps? So it went through the ways to operate a business, um, when to incorporate, how to sort of take money out, what's a deductible expense, HST, all of that good stuff. So I will share that with you as well Fantastic. to share because I can see, right, starting a small business is it's That's scary. daunting too. There's a lot of questions. Yes, absolutely. 
And in the meantime, um, so I will get this from Melissa, we'll get this out to, to everyone. Um, if you're hungry for more, we actually keep all of our TD Culture Lab webinars on our website. I'll throw a link in the chat. And we do have one from, I believe it's 2021 called Creative Money. And it was with a musician who started doing really well. And the CRA came back and said, oh, you owe us thousands of dollars. And he said, I don't understand why. <laughs> and so now he's actually a financial advisor. And he did this, this talk for us about how to budget when you have gig income. And I have steady income. And it still helped me. The resources he had were incredible. So if you want to check that one out, it's there as well. Sorry, slightly off topic from rights, but a good one. Uh, we no, do have a couple it's... more questions here for you, Melissa. Okay. Um, and a couple interesting ones. So someone was saying, how would you distribute directly to Spotify? Um, they were they thought um, or had read somewhere that Spotify required you to go through a distributor. They do. So in the business side, that's what um, the person you would go through is known as a music aggregator. So you choose your aggregator. Um, and they will um, get your music up to Spotify, Apple Music, everywhere for a small fee. Um, there is a great resource. I'm going to pull it up here. This is kind of one of my go-to people. Um, his name is Ari Herstad. And his website, podcast, everything. He's written books, um, how to make it in the new music business. But he does a really great digital music distribution chart. He looks at everyone who's in the market. And it's really helpful for you to compare and sort of contrast which one is right for you because we have so many options out there based on, and it's important to look at what works for you. Are you looking for long-term, like to release multiple albums? Are you looking to release singles? Um, do they distribute to TikTok? Do they distribute to Instagram? All of that information is contained in this massive comprehensive chart that is updated continually. So if that's helpful, I can post it in the chat. Does that work, Susan? Yeah, that would be great. Okay. Um, Because he does keep it pretty up to date. But you do need to go through an aggregator. You can't just call Apple Music or Spotify say, here's my album. They go through this process. It's sort of, you know, the gatekeepers that exist within the industry. So here's the... Yeah, he does a little video on it as well. But Ooh. there... With it... pop-ups. Brilliant. There we go. Okay, so here's the, the graphic you're talking about here. Yeah. So at the very bottom, you can kind of scroll all the way across and it is, okay. it's intense, right? So that gives you a summary at the very bottom of the page, Susan, he goes through and you can sort of see oh. everything. Yeah. It's, oh, wow. yeah. Yeah. So you can see how many options there are. Right. And the different things you might want to consider. Is there a sign up fee? What's the distribution fee? Is there a yearly fee? Uh, payment splitting? Is there a fee for adding outlets? Do they distribute to China, TikTok, Instagram? Do they distribute lyrics or credits? Uh, wow, there's so much. Go. Yeah. Amazing. What's the speed, right? With which, how quick do they get music up to Apple Music or to Spotify? customer support. Yeah. Uh, do they charge you for an ISRC code or a UPC code? Do they offer YouTube monetization? <laughs> like it's, again, there's so many moving pieces when it comes to a lot of this stuff. Um, but that's what I would suggest is take a look at Ari's take to see what will work best for you, for your needs when you're releasing music. 
That's a really great resource. Thank you, Melissa. No problem. Okay, we have another interesting question. It takes a little side spin, but it's kind of fun. Okay. What is the penalty or legal reper- repercussion for uh, someone may face when they violate copyright laws? Don't do it. <laughs> it's huge. Um, so it's really sort of become interesting. So what we used to understand for copyright infringement, there's like historically so many things. And if you follow music, I'm sure you've heard a lot in the last few years, right? We've heard uh, Dua Lipa, that was a copyright infringement case. Um, But probably, you know, some of the big ones, depending on age, of course, we have uh, Vanilla Ice with Ice, ice, baby. No, I didn't copy. I didn't steal that from Queen under pressure. So we have a lot of these examples. A big one that happened was um, Robin Thicke and Pharrell Williams with the song Blurred Lines. And that threw an interesting sort of spin into things because in the world of copyright, we always understood infringement. There had to be certain threshold met right? You had to copy a certain amount like melody or lyrics, notation. In the Blurred Lines case, um, they'll bring in musicologists. If they want to fight this, they'll bring in all these people. Blurred Lines, none of those things existed, but they were still found to be in violation of copyright based on the vibe that they created. The vibe of the song, the feeling was too similar to the Marvin Gaye song. So it sort of caused panic within the industry because we always understood it to be, okay, there has to be uh, lyrics or melody or notes in that structure. And this flipped it. So I would say be very, very careful. Um, You do not want to, I mean, if you happen to do something and get away with it, okay, but is your ultimate goal that you're going to take off in your career? And at some point, someone's going to look at your back catalog and guess what? Then if they find that, they will come after you, right? And this is all determined. It's all through courts. So legal fees, I think we can all agree, not cheap. Um, and we want to avoid that. Another thing I would suggest is if anyone samples music, okay, so taking a sample and using it in your work, always seek the permission of the copyright owner before you do that, okay? So reach out to the publisher or the songwriter if they're self-published and ask that permission. You may need to give them a little bit, a percentage of your new song that contains a sample. But I can assure you that in the long run, that's going to save you. Giving them that royalty up front is a lot better than being sued for copyright infringement and having a huge lump sum that you have to pay in damages or in future royalties. Melissa? Um, yes. Uh, uh, this is Elsa. I'm not sure. Uh, is it okay to ask a question? Just uh, to absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. If if anyone wants to ask a question out loud, feel free to unmute and jump in. You're absolutely okay. welcome to. Okay. So um, I want to explain the the that case because um, I think sometimes it's like overseas is a global thing. Say for example, if I write a song with a two part harmony uh, in Canada, and uh, if someone um, actually took my song and add a third part and add, add, add a fourth part, like a four part harmony, like a choir song, and then they claim this is their work. So how does that work? That, that do they call themselves like a, a arranger for the song and it, this becomes his song? So it wouldn't become their song. Okay. Um, you can only claim an arranger credit mm. if the work is in the public domain. 
Mm -hmm. okay. So some people will arrange things and, and maybe they do, they want to do a unique arrangement of it, but mm -hmm. it, it would be very similar to like using a sample, mm -hmm. right? They would need to contact you and you as the copyright owner for that song could say, okay, you can do an arrangement, but ultimately the royalties all would still come to you, Elsa, unless mm -hmm. you gave them mm -hmm. a portion I a songwriter's it. credit okay there's another incident and that's a real one in mississauga actually lately um mm -hmm. there was this choir piece that was from overseas from from uh, obviously it was originally from uh china or you know so that was a, a choir song it was written in i believe it was written in three parts or okay. uh, actually it was probably written in four parts exactly how many parts i don't remember but i think i believe it was in written in four parts and this choir actually they just uh, change it to two or three part and then change it to different team in one of the one of the part harmony so they actually um, did an open per performance and this was uh, i think it was kind of uh, reported by someone they knew about the background of the song so they actually reported because it's overseas so it's very hard to reach out to the original writer and eventually because this was reported, so Coral Canada, Coral Canada actually wrote a letter about this thing and uh, asked, asked them either correct it, uh, apologize or, or whatever. But because I think they could not reach out the original writer. So is this one still considered like in Canada, is this one still considered like a valid uh, copyright thing? So it, it's interesting. You're making me think of something that recently <laughs> happened and was yeah. in the news um, mm -hmm. involving the tragically hip <laughs> and yes. um, Pierre Polyev and the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. So the tragically hip were made aware that um, Pierre Polyev and the Conservative Party were using their song 50 Mission Cap mm -hmm. during a party event rally meet and greet and they were not very happy because their permission had not been asked now you might think okay yeah if someone wants to use your song for a political thing they should ask yes but legally that event took place at a venue that was in good standing and had paid their SOCAN fees. So the venue is allowed to play music because they paid their SOCAN fees. So they, you know, it becomes this weird thing. So in that situation where someone changed something, um, an interesting question would be, was the venue where it was performed, do they pay SOCAN? Because if they do, um, it would probably monies would go to the original copyright owner. But um, in addition to that, where it's really an issue is, was that new arrangement, were they claiming copyright on it? Or were they just doing a live sort of interpretation? Right? There's a lot of nuances in some of this, but a big piece to look at is, is a venue um, licensed with SOCAN? Because they perform uh, with the Coral Canada, and I I don't know whether Coral Canada is the highest authority um, for all this copyright thing, you know, besides SOCAN, how do, how do they relate? Because Coral Canada, apparently, they, they just wrote a letter to the group like that. But, and I think they were asking the group to actually uh, claim the, um, the copyright permission from the original writer, but apparently the original writer is somewhere out there, like it, you know, so it's very hard to find find um, the original writer. Right. So in this situation, I, I like to know about Coral Canada and um, to prevent in the future our performers run into any trouble. Yeah, I would say, you know, contact the organization. I'm not familiar with Coral Canada and sort of I'm looking at them right now. Mm -hmm. um, but 
so their members would be conductors, leaders, composers, and songwriters as well for choral works. Mm -hmm. So they would be a great resource resource as well. Um, but from a copyright standpoint, you know, unless someone is claiming mm -hmm. an arrangement of a work, when it's performed, the monies or royalties would go to the original copyright holder. Mm. I see. Okay. Like, for example, I could, um, a lot of times we see people perform cover versions, right? And they maybe change it, make it completely their own. You almost wouldn't even recognize the right. song. And that, that is okay. That's within the legal realm. Um, if they're performing it at a venue, because the royalties will be paid back to the original copyright owner. They, whoever performs it and sort of adapts it to make it their own, they are not receiving any royalties because they can't arrange a copyrighted work. With choral music as well, right? It really does depend on the public domain. Mm -hmm. regulations mm -hmm. it's so fascinating to hear about some of the cases and I know there is I don't know if I heard it or I heard people talking about another one where um the the copyright court case they ended up coming to the decision that these two bands who had a similar song wouldn't like both came to that similar song completely independent and wouldn't have crossed paths and there was no way that they could have stolen each other's ideas yeah, I think that's a very difficult decision to get to and not a very <laughs> very um you know an outcome that happens very often but a fascinating outcome too absolutely you can look at the history of some of these infringement cases and, and sometimes you know it's not always intentional right when people do it we maybe just don't even realize that we heard this hook somewhere and it's in our head there's only so many notes in a scale to create music <laughs> right but it you know just think about it and if, if you have a oh maybe this sounds too close to something okay maybe rework it are there um, someone has something that's very close to yours by being a part of these groups, you're protected and they'll help you fight. Absolutely. Right. Because when you register, like if you do with the Songwriters Association of Canada, you're in that song vault, it's like a date stamp when that was registered. Um, if you co-write with anyone else, I would recommend that you look, you can find online all sorts of resources that are like song split agreements where in the studio you write down all your information okay i did 50 percent. you did 50 percent. great sign it keep that for yourself as sort of proof that you you know what your understanding was at the time all parties of who was going to get what percentage because even for people in bands, you know, it's so important. You can look at some of the really successful songwriting pairs throughout history. John Lennon and Paul McCartney. Every song written was credited to both of them. It didn't matter. If John Lennon wrote 100% of one of those songs when they were with the Beatles, nope, their agreement was every song was credited 50-50 to Lennon and McCartney. And that's what worked for them. So you can figure out what's going to work for you, but make sure you have yourself sort of covered. Great. Are there any other questions? We have a few more minutes to take a, uh, a few questions. I know it's been a lot of information and I'm still digesting a lot of it. Um, some of the, the websites have been put in the chat if you do want to go back and click on any of them, but we'll make sure to add it to the email that goes out uh, later this week or early next week with, the, with all the resources for you as well. Just give it a minute for any other questions or feel free to unmute and ask a question or make a comment if you really want. Hello, Sebastian Conan here. I have a question pertaining to that conversation regarding DistroKid versus just kind of doing it yourself. Yep. Uh, 
So like, let's say I'm releasing through DistroKid, how would I then transition away from DistroKid to just do it without them then? What would so you, you can do it, You're, you still need them to get your music there, but what you would want to look at, and I'm just looking to see if it's on his chart. Yeah. A lot of them will offer to collect royalties on your behalf. And they may not have when you started, um, but it's sort of a new thing. So what I would say is look at what your agreement is with, if it's DistroKid, TuneCore, whatever, whichever one of these aggregators and see if you've allocated or allowed them or asked them to collect royalties on your behalf. And you would recommend not doing that and just doing it yourself, obviously, right? That's my opinion. Unless you're at a point where you can't register, you can't go and fill in your song information with SOCAN or CMRA. I just don't think, you know, why would you want to pay someone twice, right? Absolutely. If you're already taking a bit of a commission or an admin fee from CMRA and then look at what the fee is that DistroKid or TuneCore or whomever it is, right. United Masters is taking. Awesome. Thank you. No problem. If you can do that's it That's up to you. <laughs> yeah. Don't let them take your money. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, we're seeing so much more in the way of do it yourself, right? The options are out there for people to do it. And I'm, I'm glad that Ms. Sagar's Council is doing this because the more you know, right, it makes it easier for you to, to do some of this and manage it on your own. I know that royalties, it's, it looks complex and it looks like there's a lot, but really think of it as like one side, two side, song, recording. And then within each of those, there's two pieces. There's a performance and a mechanical. And if that's all you think of and you go, okay, CMRA, so can. Actorax, MROC, or Artisty, or Resound here, and Connect down here. That makes it a little more manageable for people, like to think of just there's those two sides. And within each, there's two. And you can sort of take care of it. Uh, we just have one more question here. Do all mm -hmm. songs through SOCAN need to be recorded? That is a great question. I mean, I can't, uh, uh, let's see. I mean, in this day and age, phones are getting a lot better. So even to get just a little, you know, you in your bedroom with your guitar, uh, sketching yeah. out the song and having, you know, a demo recording. I mean, there's certainly, certainly ways of making that happen. So, I mean, when we're talking copyright, anything that's a tangible form, right? So that could be sheet music. That's not a require a recording. Do, do, do. Or the tab with the melody written out. Yeah. I'm just double checking that. That's a great question that I have not come across. Okay. Well, this could be old. Proof of performance. Well, one of the requirements that I'm seeing here, and you could call them just to verify, but it says your music has been or will be performed in a public forum. So radio, TV, or something. So it could even be that there's the intention for that recording to happen and then become available. But I would always, you know, just pick up the phone and give them a call to confirm that. They're always happy to answer questions. You know, they work on the idea that the more people know about them and the more people that they get registered, the more people that are getting the payment that they're entitled to. Yeah. 
Wonderful. Well, thank you so much, Melissa. We're at 830. So we are out of time, but we'll definitely find ways to, to connect and we'll get these resources up on our website. Um, if you have more questions, feel free to email me. I'm admin, A-D-M-I-N, at mississaugaartscouncil.com. And I can absolutely pass questions along or you know send you more information as you need. I'll throw my email in the chat here. Um, but I would like to thank you so much, Melissa, for being a part of this. This was such a wonderful presentation. Uh, we really appreciated having you and learning from you. Uh, so much information today, which was great. Yeah. And I know everyone on this call now has so many resources to go diving into tomorrow. So we really appreciate it. Um, and also for everyone who joined us tonight and brought such great questions to the um, to the to the presentation. We really appreciate you being a part of this tonight. Um, unfortunately, or for unfortunately, this is our last webinar of our series that we've done five webinars as part of our TD Culture Lab this spring. Uh, but fortunately, they all exist on our website. Um, again, I sent that link earlier, but I'll make sure I share it with everyone. So you can absolutely access any of our webinars any of our webinar resources, they're up on our website. If you go to mississaugaartscouncil.com and look for TD Culture Lab in our programs menu, you'll be able to find everything. Um, we just want to get the info out there and share it with you because as Melissa said, the more you know, <laughs> the more you can look after yourself and protect yourself and grow your career. And that's what we're here for. Um, so we will be getting the resources out. This has been recorded and we'll make sure to share it with you. We'll also have a little survey. So if there's topics you want to see in the future, you can let us know. And, um, and, and that's about it. So again, thanks so much for joining us. And thank you, Melissa. This was so great. Thank you everyone for joining and Susan for thinking of me. I did put my email in the chat as well. Just give me some time. If, if you don't hear back from me right away, um, it is a bit, it can be a bit hectic around here, but uh, I'm happy if anyone has any questions, absolutely. Or you Thank can you find so me much. on LinkedIn. Okay. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Susan. And have a fantastic rest of your evening.